thank you for the, that introduction, although it makes it slightly daunting as well. Uh, one way of thinking about the shift from yesterday's discussion for those of you who were there to today's is that really, in many respects, yesterday I was focusing on capitalism of the early 21st century, and today I want to really take up some of the themes which have emerged around the discussion of socialism for the 21st century, even though my remarks in many ways pick up from some earlier debates. If we think about the emergence of the whole idea of socialism for the 21st century, it really comes out in the first instance from the Venezuelan experience where the slogan itself actually emerges. I was struck being in Caracas for the social forum in 2006, just how widespread this discussion is of new visions and new models of 21st century socialism. But then, of course, it has been supplemented by the experience in Bolivia, following upon the election of Evo Morales as president, uh, leader of the Movement for Socialism Party, and so on. And I think we can say that this discussion of socialism for the 21st century has represented a move forward on a number of levels for debates and discussions within the left, quite clearly, particularly under the impact of the Bolivian experience. Indigenous liberation has become much more central to the entire discussion of socialism throughout the Americas. Secondly, there's also, I think, no doubt that a whole range of formulations which converge around the theme that you're going to be talking about in this series later this term, eco-socialism, have also emerged very much as part of a discussion of socialist models that deal with the problems of both environmental destruction or capitalism and ecological sustainability of any social economic system. And I think as well, related to that, are some quite intriguing uh, discussions which have emerged around new models of democracy. Participatory democracy, direct democracy, radical democracy, and so on are a variety of terms that have emerged here. One thing which is interesting is that the discussion around, if we can put it in these terms, transition towards the socialist economy has had a lot less attention. It's happening. There's no question it's happening, but it's had a lot less attention where it has. It's much more had to do with relations between governments trying to break out of the neoliberal model. So it's had to do with the idea of a new kind of trade set of trade relations often described as ALBA, uh, where governments from Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Cuba, and so on begin to trade various goods and services in, in a variety of ways. And that's interesting. Uh, there's also been in Venezuela in particular some discussion about cooperatives and where cooperatives and a kind of social economy fits in. What I want to do is really to suggest in my remarks that all of this discussion needs to contend in a more vigorous way with the question of the market. And one of the reasons I think that that question has not been front and center has to do with the historical legacy in which the socialist left finds itself. Because really I think it's fair to say that the period of the last 20 or 25 years of discussion in this area has been dominated by a shift away from the old command economy model that we associate with the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, the idea of bureaucratic central planning, I use planning in quotes, because whether it was really a planned economy is an interesting and important question which I'm not going to be able to do any justice to. But it clearly was organized as a bureaucratically centralized command economy structure where officials in central planning ministries dictated or commanded with respect to a variety of output goals that were designed to guide the economy as a whole. In reaction to that 
model and its obvious failures by the 1980s, the predominant alternative that emerged was market socialism. And the argument here, very much take, originating in the first instance with a variety of market-oriented reformers inside the Eastern European regimes. This is where the most robust discussion of market socialism happens. It then gets picked up by a variety of commentators in the West. A new discussion then takes place in China uh, after the reforms of the late 1970s and early 80s and so on. But the premise of this discussion is in the first instance what I, what I want to challenge. Because the premise of the discussion is that if state-centered planning is a failure, and clearly there was little to recommend the models which had developed in Eastern Europe, the premise was if state-centered planning is a failure, then we must turn to the market as the coordinating, allocating, regulating mechanism which we try to insert in some way into a socialist framework. And my claim is that, that market socialism cannot fulfill its de declared objectives. That there are fundamental contradictions inherent in the very enterprise of market socialism. And as a result, as we contemplate 21st century socialism, we need to revisit key questions about planning and democracy. Because one of the interesting things is, there, of course, was another tradition in this debate, but this was a tradition which couldn't get any public airing in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. The market-oriented economists could actually write, publish, teach, and so on. The alternative position, which was always there, but radically marginalized, was to say that the central problem about planning isn't the planning can't work, it's that planning cannot work without democracy, without deep structures of popular and working class democracy, so that you have a participatory planning process fundamentally driven by working class communities, people in their places of work, and so on, actually defining the goals of the planning process, so that you've got a much more decentralized kind of process and a much more inherently participatory and democratic one. But that discussion was never legitimated inside the East Bloc economies. That discussion is one that got you in a lot of trouble by raising these issues around working class democracy, participatory democracy, and so on. But the market socialism discussion could get an error. And so I want to really step back, examine the market socialism discussion more, and then talk about the alternative. And I think really, the central claim I want to make for you about the market socialism model is that it talks about the market as a technical mechanism for resource allocation. That's its theory of the market. The market is essentially an allocative mechanism. It's a way of getting goods to those who want them. And I think this is bogus, this model. I think this model essentially surrenders everything which is most powerful and profound in the classical socialist critique, which reaches, I think, its highest point in Marx's critique of political economy. That critique has quite a different, indeed a radically different, understanding of what markets are. To begin with, it sees markets in terms of social relations that they entail, and not simply as a technical mechanism. That's the first point. Secondly, it sees markets as themselves embodying dispossession, it's something that I'll come back to. The one of the key premises of any system which is regulated by the market, and keep in mind this is what we're talking about here, market regulation. I'm not suggesting that there can be no socialist models in which markets play peripheral roles or something like that. That's not the debate for me. Of course there can be such models and they're worth engaging, discussing, 
and so on. The question is the market as the regulative mechanism. And most market socialist models try to come to terms with it as such. But if you're going to have market regulation, you require price signals. And this is the term which is used in the market socialist literature as well as in the mainstream economic literature. That is to say, it is prices that signal to economic actors, be they individuals or firms, it is prices that signal to them whether to buy or to sell. And it follows, therefore, that every good and service has to be priced by the market. Okay, so how so good? We're in the kind of textbook world of neoclassical or mainstream economics at this point. The idea that everything will have a price by the market. Okay, but what gets begged in this question, although not by the neoclassicals, they're explicit about it, is to have market regulation in this sense. Human labor, or to be more precise, the commodity labor power, as it exists within a capitalist economy, must equally be priced in the same way. It must be market disciplined and market regulated. Otherwise, you do not get market prices. You can get some other kind of prices. You come in and tinker and so on. But you do not get all of the ostensible benefits of the efficiencies of a market system. I use all of that in quotes, those claims for efficiencies and so on. And what's interesting is, as I say, that I think the neoclassicals are very clear on this. And this was, in some ways, the stumbling block of the debate that was particularly robust in countries like Poland and Hungary around market socialism in the 1970s and 80s in particular. This is, I think, the, really the stumbling block. But you get it in Ludwig von Mises, one of the uh, sort of key theorists of the hardcore neoclassical model uh, that gets taken up by the, the neoliberals. He writes, uh, in the market economy, quote, man deals, I have to accept the gendered language because these guys are nothing if not gendered, man deals with other people's labor in the same way he deals with all scarce material factors of production. As far as there are wages, labor is dealt with like any material factor of production and bought and sold on the market. And it seems to me that this has always been, for the socialist critique, of market regulation, the key issue right there, that the market requires human labor power as a commodity if it's going to be the economic regulator. And this can only mean a whole system of social relations that are best described as alienated and reified. That is to say, human labor and capacity has to be treated, as it's put by von Mises here, as a scarce factor of production, like any other thing that can be priced by the market in terms of supply and demand, and its price, therefore, determined in this way. That's why, by the way, the genuine market socialists uh, acknowledge that there would have to be unemployment in a genuine socialist market economy. Mm -hmm. Then you deal with the unemployed more humanely than capitalist economies typically do. But there would have to be unemployment, because again, if you have state policy creating full employment in any way, you're now violating price symbols, signals. You're now violating the determination of the prices of all factors of production, including labor, by supply and demand. And so inherent in this model is, as I say, first, dispossession. It presumes that the direct producers themselves do not own control and manage their own means of production. It assumes that they are separated from such control. And therefore, to be brought together with the means of producing wealth, they must first sell their capacity to labor. The buyer, the employer, the representative of the firm, and so on, then unites them through the wage agreement. They produce commodities. 
under the terms of that wage agreement, and this act is repeated over and over again. So they are dispossessed. They, therefore, are alienated from means of production. They are alienated from the products of their own labor, which belong to the firm, an enterprise, whatever it is called, not to them. And they repeatedly re-enter this alien system called the market in order to acquire the means of life. Without selling labor power, you don't acquire the means of life, except for the unemployed to get dealt with uh, in a separate way. And they are to be, I think, uh, in all of these cases, considered fairly uh, marginal to, uh, to, to this whole operation. So once we accept, I think, that for the market to regulate, it must regulate human labor power. There therefore must be social alienation and there must be a wages system. The other side of the coin, which touches on comments that I made yesterday when I talked about how capital is also constrained by the logic of the system, then the various producing enterprises must enter into competitive relations. They must. If there's no market competition, then in fact you're also not establishing true market prices. So they must enter into competition in a variety of ways for market share. The consumer at this point becomes sovereign in the argument because they choose those commodities which they want to buy. This determines which firms accumulate and which firms go under. Again, that's why most socialism, uh, market socialist models acknowledge bankruptcies. There had to be the capacity for firms to fail and so on. And so the decentralized units of the system also must exist in a context of competitive relations and the patterns of investment growth and accumulation are determined by who prospers in the battle for market share and who doesn't. Now, you can then say, and some market socialists do, that the state can come in and tax these surpluses in a variety of ways and redistribute and reallocate and so on. And then we're back to the classic question of how it is that you then have these social struggles over the distribution of such surplus. But I think we need to be clear that what's happening in a model like this is that you retain commodified labor power. Human labor and capacity remains a commodity to be bought and sold. And all of the wider set of cultural and social implications that go with this. This relates to a claim which I will make, picking up on a, a term used elsewhere. Uh, Alfred Sonreithel uh, is the one who uses it in his book, Intellectual and Manual Labor. The, I, the claim that every society also has a system, as he puts it, of social synthesis. And the market, I'll argue, in addition to being more than just a technical regulator, but being a system of social relations, is also a system of social synthesis. And I want to spend a minute on this, because what the term implies is this, that the relations between humans and the relations between humans and nature are mediated in some way, in some institutional form, in every society. It can be done communally, we have communal social organizations, through which our relations with one another are organized and regulated. These can be the basis for communal land ownership. For instance, then the relationship with nature is one organized through communal forms and practices and so on. Or, as in a market system, the market can be the principal form in which this synthesis between humans on the one hand and humans and nature is organized. And I think this aspect of Marx's critique of market regulation is really underappreciated. It's clearly there for, I know you're going to be talking with David Harvey later about cap, Marx's capital and how it fits into these discussions. And really the classic discussion in volume one of Marx's capital on um, this aspect, the classic discussions are 
the, session, the section, part four of chapter one on the fetishism of commodities, where Marx describes the, how relations between the humans become thingified. Mm -hmm. Humans must relate to one another as things. And the famous part eight on the so-called primitive accumulation of capital, where Marx talks about dispossession as being the key to a market regulated system. You can't get market regulation if most people possess the means of producing, re, producing and reproducing themselves. People only surrender themselves to the market. And I think what's interesting is all the anthropological and historical evidence just overwhelmingly <clears throat> confirms this over and over again. Given alternatives to market regulation and wage labor, most people will seek those alternatives. Which is why neoliberalism spends so much time trying to close off all of these alternatives. We had a York University a beautiful thesis written on how the neoliberal government elected in 1995 in Ontario. Why was it that they were so adamant about creating safe streets, quote unquote, mm -hmm. on which people couldn't panhandle, and in particular their target, so-called squeegee kids, mm -hmm. who for a dollar were offering to clean your window screens. And his argument was these people represented no real social threat, but they were a key problem in terms of evading wage labor, evading market discipline, and so on. And this idea that to operate as a system of social synthesis, the market must regulate our interactions with one another. It's Marx's classic claim that we carry our social bond with one another in our pocket, i.e. that it's money in a capitalist society and that the market becomes a defining connection as well with the natural environment is, I think, quite crucial. Parenthetical point on that, of course, I think it, this will uh, overlap a lot with the discussions you'll have with Michael Lowy about eco-socialism. Because once we talk about the market regulation uh, imperative as a system of social synthesis mm -hmm. involving humans and nature, then, of course, inherent in it is all of those things that all kinds of environmentalists, even non-socialist ones, point out over and over and over again. The way the living organisms of the natural environment are reduced to mere things who, upon which the instrumental goals of human activity can be imposed with willy-nilly any care whatsoever for what it is that they are integrally are, the undermining of metabolic systems and ecosystems, and, uh, and so on. So I introduce this concept of the market as a system of social synthesis with that in mind. I also want to say something about the concept of, or the experiential structure of time in a market regulated system. Because this is something, again, which I think hasn't received a lot of attention, you get some of it in Moshe Postone's book, Time, Labor, and Social Domination, mm -hmm. the idea that capitalism requires abstract time. That, in fact, because in a market-regulated system, we are all, unless we're owners of capital, I'm going to assume for the sake of argument among friends here that none of us are owners of big capital, uh, therefore, we are all owners of that commodity or potential commodity called human labor power. But of course, human labor power is fundamentally interchangeable. That is to say, although we all have unique qualitative life histories, different skill sets, and so on, we are all in principle for capital, ultimately interchangeable. There is another potential unit of labor power out there that can do what we do. This homogenization of labor power within the market is crucial because otherwise you cannot get the key expression of abstract labor for Marx the very basis of value in a capitalist economy you cannot get to socially necessary labor time that is to say the idea that every commodity produced under competitive circumstances has a socially necessary amount of time for its production, after which the capitalist is literally wasting time, 
and the time does not count. And that's really the key point about Marx's argument. The inefficient units of capital may think they are producing a commodity in X amount of time, but in fact, if they're an hour over, they're really producing it in X minus one as far as the market is concerned. The other, the qualitative, real, concrete increments of labor time that go in do not all count. They are reduced to the same abstract standard. They are reduced to socially necessary labor time. And this economy of time, in fact, begins to govern the very structure of our lives in a capitalist society. Time becomes empty, homogeneous, abstract, and interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Of course, we all try to escape from that. It's why the parts of our lives where time is something different become so precious. Mm -hmm. The times that we spend outside of wage labor, in relations with loved ones, for instance, which we spend as much time remembering as we can, whereas, of course, the time of labor is a constant time of forgetting, <laughs> of trying to get rid of what's done to us during those periods of time where we're treated as interchangeable units of production. Because, in fact, Marx's classic formulation from 1847, real life begins outside of production. But the capitalist economy has an economy of time which is abstracted, homogeneous, or, to use the wonderful formulation that Lukács uses in History and Class Consciousness, spatialized. It becomes just a quantitative unit. And of course, when you start to look at management manuals, you mm -hmm. discover that in fact this is precisely what they do. In my favorite recent example uh, is the ones that appear in the film Supersize Me, where you know, every act in producing a Big Mac is actually standardized and quantified by McDonald's and so on. But of course, this appears in a variety of such uh, manuals. Beautiful discussion in Harry Braverman's Labor and Monopoly Capital of, the, of books that, that do uh, exactly this. So that, for example, he takes the Guide to Office Clerical Time Standards and points out that according to this guide, to open and close a file drawer takes 0, 0, 0.004 minutes. To get up from a chair takes 0 0.033 minutes. To turn in a swivel chair takes 0 0.009. To read a three-digit number takes 0 0.005. And every system of production is calibrated on these quantitative standards. This is what it means for time to become spatialized, for the time of our lives literally just to become a set of numbers. And as I say, part of my argument here is that the market socialist debate of the 1970s and 80s in particular just short-circuited all of this discussion about market regulation, commodification of labor power, social synthesis between humans and between humans and nature, and the economy of abstract time that uh, prevails in a capitalist economy. I would go farther, uh, as I have briefly in my book, Bodies of Meaning, to argue that it has an enormous amount to do even with the forms of bodily experience, which are characteristic of capitalism, the very ways in which we come to understand our corporeality. And in particular, of course, the idea that we have human bodily powers which are separable, which can be turned over to somebody else for a wage and sold for a period of time. Which, by the way, my book, Monsters of the Market, is one of the reasons that I argue that things like organ harvesting have become such powerful metaphors for late capitalism. The idea that capital, in fact, is buying our body parts. And often there are nefarious schemes and conspiracies and so on that are associated with this. But it is really this idea that there's a structure of corporeal experience in which our bodies literally lose their integrity because they are regularly surrendered to others, turned over to capital to be disciplined, and so on. And of course, the, the idea that the market is a form of social discipline is crucial here. When I have taught, at times, at York University, a political economy of labor course, 
one of the things I do is to use a film which shows a General Motors assembly line just outside of Toronto, where students are generally, in the first instance, shocked mm -hmm. to see growing men and women ringing a bell mm -hmm. repeatedly sometimes until someone can come to relieve them so they can go and use the toilet. Mm -hmm. This degree of regimentation and control over our bodily activity, you cannot leave the line until management actually authorizes it. And I'm saying really to you that if, we're, if market socialists are serious, and I think this is where the debate came to its impasse in the 1980s, about the market as a regulator, then it has to, they have to contemplate all of this. And I think, in fairness to them, uh, two market socialists did, in a very famous formulation, uh, which was really the point at which they moved off of socialism entirely. This comes from a, a famous work by Bruce and Lasky, uh, where they conclude in their discussion, it's called, the book is called From Marx to the Market. Mm -hmm. And they're really, in a certain sense, it's, in addition to being a theoretical text, it's a kind of intellectual autobiography for them. That is to say, they're tracing their own movement from Marx to, uh, to the market. And what they argue is, is the following. If marketization is the right direction of change, it must be pursued consistently. And they say, this means that, quote, not only the original Marxist promise has to be cast aside as anachronistic, but also the very concept of transition from capitalism to socialism. <laughs> so it's with that in mind that I now want to turn around and talk about some of the objections that are, of course, mobilized, sometimes very powerfully, against the idea that we could have another coordinating mechanism or regulating mechanism other than the market. Because in a lot of ways, it was a fatalistic challenge that was laid down. The market may not be our preferred regulator, said a lot of the market socialists, but it's the only one we've got. Everything else is a disaster. Planning doesn't work. Look at the Soviet Union. Therefore, we're going to have to learn how to live with the market, but by the end, as people like Bruce and Lasky acknowledged, they really had to give up the socialist part of market socialism. And I don't see them as idiosyncratic. I see them as consistent. Uh, I had a private debate years and years ago with someone who was arguing to me in response to my book against the market that China was going to show us the truly viable market socialism. And I think we know where that ended up. Uh, and I think there are very powerful and compelling reasons why it ended up there. So let me turn around now and throw out just a few propositions and then try to just put a little bit of flesh on them before we open up the, the discussion further. The key argument at the time really was the complexity argument. The, ar the argument that was used over and over again was that there, there was no way of planning a modern economy. These economies are simply too complex, too many goods and services are being produced for this to be possible. The range of investment decisions <coughs> that is required is simply too overwhelming to imagine any planning process could make any sense of them. Well, I want to begin by, on this point, by reminding you that contrary to the neoclassical claims, the modern corporation, much of the time, most of the time, does not respond to price signals. That's not what they're doing. They are doing a variety of other things in the first instance. Consumer research. They're tracking patterns of consumption. They're looking at last year's sales figures and the sales figures from the year before, and they are projecting forward. They're not waiting for price signals to come in. They're using a whole range of this kind of consumer information that they get repeatedly to guide their decisions about investment, output, and so on. 
So to begin with, the neoclassical claim that price signals are guiding the modern corporation is, I think, for a lot of the time, really misleading. It's true, big and dramatic changes in prices will influence their decisions, but day in and day out, they're tracking sales patterns and so on. Second point in this regard, they're using modern inventory control systems. This is where all the just-in-time business of the neoliberal period comes in, and it's one of the things that the scanners in our supermarkets are doing, is they're sending information all the time. Not price signals, they're sending literally physical, numerical <coughs> information about the number of X, Y, and Z goods that are still sitting on the shelves, what's being depleted and what's not. Brackets, they're also monitoring under the economy of time that I was just talking about, the number of transactions that a cashier can run through per minute. Okay, they're tracking the efficiencies of labor at the same time as they're doing inventory control and the like. So one thing we need to keep in mind is that where we have reasonably stable patterns of consumption, any agency in our society can pretty much do what modern corporations do. Just look at the patterns of consumption. You then take in demographic factors with respect to the growth of the population, its aging, and the distribution in different age groups, where the population is settled regionally in terms of the goods and services this involves, and so on. But then, of course, we have a whole range of goods in modern capitalism, which are really not at all governed by price signals. These are the kinds of huge fixed investments that are taking place I, with respect to fundamental infrastructures of the system. It's overwhelmingly not governed. The creation of hydroelectric generating capacity and so on. Fundamentally, based on all kinds of projections about the growth of the population, demand for energy, and so on and so forth. Same goes for hospitals, schools, roads, postal infrastructures, and so on and so forth. Most of these, as you know, most of them are still largely coming in through the public sector, and in fact, many efforts to privatize some of these, like private highways and so on, don't always go so well for the overzealous neoliberal privatizers. But when you think about decisions as to the hiring of teachers, nurses, the geographic distribution of doctors, social workers, varieties of it, social administrators, and so on. None of this is being allocated by the market. None of this is being determined by price signals, and so on. In all of these areas, the neoliberals have essentially constructed a fiction. They've constructed a fiction in which the whole economy is, looks like the day-to-day -day purchases we make of very short-term consumables, like the cup of coffee in the morning, for instance. The reality is that the large consumption goods that most individuals and households enter into are long-term. Housing, automobiles, furniture, electronics and electrical goods, none of these are like our day-to-day -day purchases of a cup, of a cup of coffee and a muffin. As a result, they have pretty predictable patterns to them. They're very easy to track. It does not make, it's not a complicated task. Unlike, you know, what coffee bar I'll go to in the morning, where there, I have a lot of discretion. The number of pairs of jeans, pairs of shoes, coats, televisions, beds, houses, motorcycles, bicycles, and so on. All of these are goods with fairly long lifespans, and therefore whose general production is not relying on day-to-day -day price signals uh, at all, and needn't 
have them uh, to get us there. So I think the complexity argument looks good at the margins. When we then move into those goods which clearly have certain kinds of scarcities that are much more pronounced, high-end French wines. In this country, for sure, Cuban cigars. <laughs> uh, you know, these kinds of items. But the idea then that there can, there could be a market <laughs> sector for non-standard consumption goods, I don't see any problem with any kind of democratically planned model of a socialist economy which says, yeah, there are marginal goods, I like rare books, somebody else likes French wine, somebody else wants tickets to go to Stratford, Ontario to see Shakespeare plays, uh, and this will be an area in which there can be limited kinds of markets and so on, not as the central coordinating devices of an economy, not as the fundamental regulators through which human beings reproduce themselves. In other words, not determining their access to housing, food, health care, water, education, basic cultural and recreational goods, and so on. And I simply cannot see any compelling argument on the level of complexity against our capacity to have democratically planned social consumption sector, where then you have matters of democratically determined public policy around, okay, roughly how many hours per week ought the healthy adult to contribute to society's general reproduction by way of your labor which fulfills your entitlement to the social consumption goods that your household requires. There have to be some standard determined, there have to be all kinds of exceptions based on ability, health and well-being, and so on, but fundamentally that access to the fundamental goods of life need not be market regulated. And that's uh, really the, the, the key argument that uh, I'm trying to make here. One way of thinking about this is really to ask ourselves this. What in principle, in principle, is the obstacle to expanding the non-commodified consumption sectors that exist in any capitalist economy? I know they're constrained in all kinds of ways. Either their decommodification is partial, higher education, for example, public universities like the one I teach at, it is partially decommodified. But students are still paying tuition fees I don't think they should pay, and so on. But we have a partial decommodification. Uh, as some of you know, we have effectively something pretty close to full decommodification of healthcare in Canada. Yeah, yeah, there's a few private clinics here and there, but usually the wealthy decide to go to Johns Hopkins or something like that, uh, and they come across the border from the private healthcare. By and large, we have decommodified healthcare in Canada. Like you, we have pretty good, robust public library systems, for instance. Most of our roads are not toll roads. And most of the time we just move around by bicycle or car or on foot and so on without paying for our access to them and so on. In other words, we have some level of a non-commodified or at least partially decommodified sector within any developed capitalist <coughs> economy. So then the question becomes what in principle is the obstacle to its expansion? Because fundamentally that's what we're talking about. Now, I know there are all kinds of social and political obstacles to it, but at this point I'm taking the argument through at the level of theoretical exposition and asking if healthcare in Canada can be organized in this way, if higher education and the public education system can be, roads and postal services generally can be, if a robust public library system can be, and so on. Why not housing? What makes it impossible for housing to be so organized, for instance? What makes it impossible 
for the production and distribution of the basic foodstuffs of life, not to be so organized. And I, I've yet to see any, the only argument that, that you see usually coming back is the complexity one. Mm -hmm. Too hard to figure it all out. Mm -hmm. and, so on. and yet somehow, for all of the lack of democracy and bureaucratic screw-ups and so on, most of you who are students arrived at a campus in which there was a course schedule that more or less worked. Okay, You went to a given classroom, there was an instructor, there were enough chairs, and so on and so forth. And all of this happened without price signals. Okay, And that's really the key point to my argument. That every society on the planet has a sphere of largely and sometimes fully non-commodified consumption of a whole range of the goods of life. And the idea that it cannot be expanded to include other spheres, I find unconvincing. And I think the, only, the, the argument tends to revert very, very quickly to some of the most simplistic or simple-minded claims. And you get either the old human nature claim, mm -hmm. humans will never put up with it because they won't have enough choice of toothpaste uh, kind of claim. Okay, I think we can deal with that if, if you want to, but I'm not going to pursue it here right now because I'm not persuaded that 17 toothpaste with effectively the same chemical composition is really an expansion of human freedom. But we can <laughs> come back to that if, if, we, if we need to go through the point. So there's the human nature one, there's the complexity one, or there is the historical example one, which is to say it was tried and it didn't work. And I think what's clear now in all of the discussion of 21st century socialism is that what has moved onto the agenda is debate and discussion around a whole variety of new models of socialism, some of which retrieve much elements of much older socialisms, the much more democratic, emancipatory, and liberatory traditions of socialism, which got marginalized for a whole variety of, of, uh, of historical reasons. I want to take a minute or two uh, on the question of is any of this more than idle speculation? And suggest to you that it is and that we can see, I think, why this whole debate around 21st century socialism emerged if we look at the historical development of the anti-neoliberal movement from the, I'm going to say, the mid-1990s onwards. Because what you track increasingly through this, I would argue, in a certain sense, from the Zapatista Rebellion when the North American Free Trade Agreement came into being. And when you look at the key element of the NAFTA Agreement, that the Zapatistas were organizing opposition to, it is the provision that the Mexican government passed which allows for the privatization of communal indigenous lands. This was the key provision that the Mexican government put in place in synchrony with NAFTA. In other words, we had right there, from the mid-1990s onwards, the confrontation between market and communal principles this question of whether indigenous communal lands could be privatized by the Mexican state, whether they could be opened up to private ownership. By the way, we have exactly this debate happening with indigenous lands right now in Canada as well, and it's a huge issue, not only in the Americas, but this is where it begins. Then you take the next high point of anti-neo-liberal rebellion in the global south, Cochabamba, Bolivia, in the year 2000. And what's it about? It's about retaining water as a common good and resisting and in fact ultimately overturning its privatization. You take the struggles of the landless workers movement. So I'm, I was in, involved in a discussion about this yesterday as to why in my historical materialism article on uh, the global slump I put such emphasis on movements like the landless workers movement. Well key to the landless workers movements in countries like Brazil and Bolivia, but also in other parts of the world where Via Campesina is alive and well and active, is 
the argument that land is there for human use, that in Marxian terms, its use ought to be governed by use values, not the value structures and coordinates of the capitalist market economy, and therefore that it is acceptable to occupy unused private owned land and to turn it over to new farming practices organized by essentially insurgent communities which are occupying this land. So in each one of these cases, whether it's land in Mexico, whether it's water in Cochabamba, whether it's struggles over land, whether it is big movements in countries like India over literally seeds and life forms, the struggles against Monsanto and companies like this, what you're seeing, I believe, running through that movement that we started to call the global justice mm -hmm. movement coming from the mid-1990s in reaction to neoliberalism was precisely the push to decommodify, to both to resist further encroachments of commodification and in the case of seizing land, to decommodify land, to argue that it would not be treated as a market entity, as a commodity based on private property rights, but that it should be subject to communal use, in this case by occupying communities of landless people. So I think in fact the the kind of model the reason the kind of model that I'm talking about of a democratic participatory decommodifying social process, because really that's what we're talking about, is a decommodifying process governed by communities and, I would argue, assembly-style democracy that, and by the way, that's very much what emerged, for example, during the insurgency in Kuala in the, the spring of 2000, that I'm not just concocting an abstract model. While I am returning to debates that emerged during the market socialism literature and, and discussion, I think, in fact, this discussion is something that is resonating with a whole variety of social movements around the world right now who in response to, who in the first sense has defined themselves as anti-neoliberal, but as many of you will know, then the question of anti-capitalism came onto the agenda for a whole variety of these movements and that's really where the discussion of socialism for the 21st century uh, emerges and I think the critique of the market as regulator of social life deserves to be central to that debate and discussion, that it resonates with those movements that resist privatization, that push forward the bounds of the global commons, as it's often referred to in the global justice movement, and essentially are raising, whether they're articulating it in, in precisely these terms or not, raising the question of the decommodification of social life, to diminish the role of the market as the central regulator, and in so doing, to move towards a new form of social synthesis, which is democratic and participatory. And in that sense, I return really to that classic opposition between democracy and the market. Because central to the market is the claim that the economy cannot be a sphere of democratic regulation that the economy has to be subjected to its own set of imperatives outside of human control to which we all must surrender. And the argument about decommodification, therefore, I think needs to be simultaneously the argument about radical democratization. That that sphere of social life that we call the economy can be subjected to public purposes and democratic control and so in that sense, for the socialism of the 21st century, I think decommodification and democratization need to be, ought to be, and in fact only can be, uh, two sides of the same coin. So I will stop there. Thank you very much.